For the last part of this lecture, we're going to look at how culture can unify and how we can have a diversity of cultures. So the main argument here is that when culture is unified, you're, you're going to predict that a society has a lot of solidarity and order. On the other hand, if a society has a great deal of diverse cultures, they're going to have a lot of freedom, but possibly a lot of violence and war. So let's take a look at those two arguments. What holds society together? One of the first sociologists was named Emile Durkheim. He argued that early civilizations were held together by common belief systems, a common morality. The people in these early societies shared institutions, therefore they had a shared culture. For example, they had shared religious institutions, therefore everyone had similar beliefs about spirituality and the divine. They had shared economic system, Therefore, everyone had similar beliefs about work and resources. Whether we're talking about hunters and gatherers or early farmers, Durkheim argued it was a shared culture. And by culture, he means belief, knowledge, morality, identity, language, all combined created a great deal of solidarity and order. So here's a great quote from sociologist Alan Johnson. The more I see other cultures, the more I am aware of my own culture as a culture, and that things aren't just what they are, but are what my culture makes them out to be. I can also see that when I make a choice, I'm always, I always choose from a limited range of alternatives offered by my culture. When I feel myself wanting a new car, I don't realize how much my wanting a new car is connected to a cultural value placed on material possessions. For example, more stuff is better than less, and new stuff is better than old, and stuff I don't have is better than stuff I do. The values we acquire limit us in ways that are hard to see until we step outside and realize they aren't the only options. I can expand my freedom only by liberating myself from the narrow range of choices that my culture, that any culture, offers the people who participate in it. To do this, I need to step outside the cultural framework I'm used to so I can see it as a framework, as one possibility amongst many. End quote. Think about this. When you travel, you get to see other people living in different ways, interpreting the world in ways that are different from you. And then, according to Johnson, you're gaining freedom. Because as you see people do making different choices, you realize Wow, I never realized there was a choice here. Why? Because our, our culture puts every single idea inside of our head, and we literally can't even see a choice because our culture hasn't shown us that it's a choice. But when we experience other cultures, we gain that freedom. We see how many choices are available to us. A simple example is something like religion. Your whole life, maybe your parents took you to their particular church, you went there for many years, and then suddenly you're 20 years old, you're going to college, and your friend says, hey, do you want to go to my church? And suddenly, you're going to go and see another option. You're going to see other ways of interpreting reality. And now you have a choice to make, a, a free choice. Do I want to continue with my parents' religion? Do I like my friend's religion? Do I want to try other religions? You're gaining freedom by experiencing other cultures. Sociologist Ann Swidler argues, all real cultures contain diverse and often conflicting symbols, rituals, stories, and guides to action. The reader of the Bible can find a passage to justify almost any act. The traditional wisdom usually comes in paired adages counseling opposite behaviors. A culture is not a unified system that pushes action in a consistent direction. Rather, it's more like a toolkit or, or a repertoire from which actors select different pieces for constructing lines of action. What Swidler is arguing is that many people think that culture is this monolithic thing that gives you clear answers. This is true. This is false. This is good. This is bad. This is beautiful. This is ugly. This is the correct behavior. This is the incorrect behavior. But she argues that's not how culture works. Within our modern cultures, 
we're getting two different stories. So here's some examples of paired adages counseling opposite behavior behaviors. The early bird gets the worm. That's telling you to get up early and do your stuff. But then we're also told good things come to those who wait. So we're simultaneously telling people, get out there, you know, be aggressive, go for it first thing in the morning. But we're also telling people to be patient. Look before you leap. He who hesitates is lost. Two heads is better than one. If you want something done right, do it yourself. Do you see how our culture's offering us these very opposing and conflicting ideas? Two heads is better than one is saying, sit with your classmate and figure this out. Sit down with your husband or wife and try to figure it out. But at the same time, I hope everyone has heard the phrase, if you want to do something right, do it yourself. So there's a whole bunch of these that sociologists are aware of where we're being told two messages that are totally opposite, but they're both parts of our culture, according to Swidler. So if we looked at the hunting and gathering and the early farmers, you know, society was held together by common culture, beliefs, knowledge, morality, things like that. But modern cultures are diverse and conflicting. People in modern societies practice a variety of religion or no religion. People in modern societies have very different jobs in the economy. I mean, imagine, you know, a surgeon versus a, you know, a sex worker. <laughs> imagine a somebody who drives a snowplow. People in modern societies have very different jobs. Some people are farmers. Some people are doctors. Some people are lawyers. Some people are construction workers. Some people are sex workers, and some people are clergy. We have a variety of jobs, and we have tons of job specialization in a modern economy. So what is holding these people together? We have a variety of political beliefs. We have liberals. We have conservatives. Um, in other countries, you have multiple political parties. And people have a variety of beliefs about family. Um, today, we see this debate happening in America about homosexuality, trans, and gender roles in our society. So the question Durkheim asks, as an early sociologist who's seeing the modern period unfold in front of his eyes, is what holds modern societies together? It's a great question. And it's actually one that many sociologists and economists and anthropologists have asked. What holds modern societies together? So... What are some possible answers? Well, Durkheim plays with the idea that we have an interdependent economic system. And while we, we're not all farmers that puts us all on the same page, maybe I need the farmer to get my food and the farmer needs me to teach his son or daughter sociology. And my neighbor is a police officer, so he's going to protect my house and I'm going to teach his son or daughter sociology. Do you see how we're all interdependent? And even capitalists like uh, Adam Smith talks about having this interdependent economic system where we all depend on each other, and we realize we all depend on each other, and it holds modern societies together. Another possible answer that Durkheim looked at was what he called the cult of the individual. And basically, it also means consumerism. This idea that rather than being part of a society where we're all united, arms linked with similar morality, we're all sort of believing in this idea of the individual. And we're linked by the idea that we're striving for individuality and we all sort of value individuality which ultimately ends up being something like consumerism and the power of the individual. So he argues maybe that's what's holding us together. The same thing that's sort of tearing us apart, individuality, is also what's linking us together. It's a complicated idea, but if you think about it as sort of like consumerism, we're sort of linked arms holding society together in our love of consumption and having sort of consumer identities, maybe that is what holds society together. Another option that Durkheim really doesn't explore, but other social scientists and historians explore, is the idea that the nation-state and nationalism is holding modern societies together. One of the things we have to think about is, does the nation-state and nationalism hold us together when we're not fighting wars, particularly when we're not fighting total wars? 
when we're all, again, linked arms, we're fighting the common enemy, the Americans are fighting the Germans, the Americans are fighting the Japanese. Yes, warfare, the nation state nationalism holds a modern society together. But what happens in an era where we're not fighting these total wars? Are we still being held together by the nation state and nationalism? So that's another possible option we can think about. Last, what holds modern societies together? Well, what if our society is not being held together? What if our society is spinning off in different directions? Groups of people going up, down, left, right, east, west, north, south, and society is actually being pulled apart as our society has a different social structure and different culture, and we're having more and more subcultures and more and more institutions, maybe we're actually being pulled apart. And Durkheim, back in the late 1800s, was saying, what holds modern societies together? Asking that question. And today, we're actually in trouble because there are not things that are really holding us, holding us together, or the things that have held us together in the past are no longer working for some reason. So that's just something for you to consider. This idea that our culture and that our society is not being held together by culture is actually something that many social scientists have discussed. Um, right here we have a group of books. We have The Clash of Civilizations and the Remaking of World Order by political scientist Samuel Huntington. He wrote an article in 1992 and in 1996 basically predicting that we were going to have this this war between traditional societies that are more like on the Islamic side of things, like terrorism, and you're going to have first world nations like the United States, England, France, and Germany. Similarly, right around the same time period, Benjamin Barber wrote an article in 1992, and he wrote a book in 1995 called Jihad versus McWorld, Terrorism's Challenge to Democracy. This is before 9-11 happened. These political scientists were predicting that there was going to be a war between, you know, Western Europe the United States and these countries in the Middle East, countries that are using terrorism that are not really linked to the nation state, but more about things like religion, jihad. And what about within the United States? Um, James Davison Hunter is a, is a sociologist who wrote a book in 1992 that he called Culture Wars, The Struggle to Define America, and he wrote another book in 2007 called Before the Shooting Starts. Davison Hunter argues that the United States is divided into two groups. He calls them orthodox and progressives. Today, we might call them liberals and conservatives. But even in the 90s, he saw this break in America between these two groups that had different institutions, different cultures, pulling America in different directions. And if you think again about COVID-19, if you think about climate change, if you think about issues regarding the family, um, if you think about Black Lives Matter versus All Lives Matter, James Davison Hunter was predicting these different cultures fighting against each other way back in the 90s that this would be happening. It's really fascinating stuff, and I do want you to think about how culture is at the center of a lot of violence and disagreement and conflict. The other thing I want to add about James Davison Hunter's book is he argues that when you have a culture war, the two sides do not see each other as legitimate. If you believe that Black Lives Matter is this horrible movement of terrorists who don't believe in justice and don't and believe that we should defund the police and defunding the police is this horrible thing, and on the other side, if you see you know, the police as, as fascists, <laughs> or if you believe that um, all lives matter is, is a totally unacceptable movement, if both of these sides see each other as unacceptable and illegitimate, they can't negotiate. They can't form a democracy where they try to find a solution that works for both sides. So James Davison Hunter is very worried about America because culture wars are about morality, truth, and it, it's my truth versus your truth. And when you have a culture war, he argues, it's hard to negotiate because both sides see the other one is illegitimate. Again, we're talking about what is real for both, for both groups. And the groups have opposing definitions of what reality is. So that can go poorly and you can get a lot of problems. 